Good morning, everybody. A couple of months ago, um, when I realized we were going to have a fall address and be in person and be gathered here together in this historic theater, in this, the oldest standing building on our campus, I started to tear up. Not figuratively, but literally started to tear up. Things changed a little bit between now and then. We have masks on now, but we are here. <laughs> We're together. And for all of us here in this room, and for all of us joining uh, by distance and at our branch campuses, thank you. Thank you for coming. And just so we're all clear on this, yes, it's the same tie. <laughs> and we have so much to talk about today. We have so much to talk about today. But before I begin, there's one thing I'm going to do that I'm very happy to do. In fact, I'm very excited about doing it because it illustrates one of our accomplishments over this last year. I want to acknowledge that the land upon which Idaho State University's campus in Pocatello sits is within the original Fort Hall reservation boundaries and is the traditional and ancestral home of the Shoshone and Bannock peoples. We acknowledge the Shoshone and Bannock peoples, their elders past and present, their future generations and all indigenous peoples, including those upon whose original lands this university is located. We offer gratitude for the land itself and the original caretakers of it and we pledge to be good stewards of that land going forward. As a public research university, it is our ongoing responsibility to teach accurate histories of indigenous people. And it is our commitment to the Shoshone and Bagot tribes and to all ISU constituents to do just that. And I wanna thank the faculty, the staff, and our Native American tribes who worked together to formally adopt this land acknowledgement. So thank you all for coming here today. Um, and I'm glad that everyone is here. And in particular, I'd like to thank our Pocatello Mayor, Brian Blad, for coming out to join us today. Appreciate that. So there is no way to talk about the upcoming year and no way to meaningfully talk about our future without taking a few minutes to talk about what we just went through. So how can I, in good conscience, get through this fall address without specifically mentioning and thanking all of our employees? Every area, every area of the university deserves thanks and praise for their reaction to the pandemic. And without lessening that thank you to everyone, I want to specifically mention our essential workers. Now I know other groups deserve as much praise and not mentioning them specifically isn't an oversight, but there are four groups that I wanna thank in particular. First, our human resources department. For the last 18 months, you kept our people going. You answered questions, you provided compassion for our employees, you shifted the way you did things, you went above and beyond the call so many times, ensuring that our people at Idaho State University, we're supported by our human resources department. Thank you, human resources, for all that you did. <laughs> Second, to our registrar's office, to the group that had to reroom thousands, thousands of sections of classes on short notice to accommodate the needs of our faculty in those classrooms while making sure our student needs were met in those classrooms as well, for shifting on a moment's notice for class registration times and deadlines to meet the needs of our students and faculty. To our registrar's office, I say thank you. Third, 
to every instructor and faculty member, to every one of you that had to engage with students in an often very challenging way, with face coverings, on Zoom, by email, over a discussion forum, for all those faculty who thrive by engaging our students in person face to uncovered face, this last year was so hard, yet you all stepped up. Thank you, faculty. And finally, to our facilities employees, to all those custodians, landscapers, the trades and technicians, and all of you who were those frontline essential workers that had to come to work no matter what to keep this university operational. Without you, all that we do, everything would have failed. You kept us open. You kept us in sanitized environments. You made it so that we could continue to deliver education to our students. There is no amount of thank you that is enough to our facilities employees who every day make this university a fantastic, beautiful, and functional place to come to work. From everyone in this room and everyone remote, facilities employees, we owe you more than we can possibly say. Thank you. And what all of you did, what all of us did across every area of the university, how you all stepped up and did things we never had to do before. Well, it reminds me of a story. A story about a sea rescue and a guy named Irvin Mansky. But this story for us starts later than that. It starts by looking back to April 3rd, 2020. April 3rd, 2020 was three weeks after we went into lockdown and after we took our entire course delivery and converted it to distance-based and after we figured out how in that short time to remain open and serve our mission and deliver on the education to students during a global pandemic, I recorded a short message to the campus and it was this. This university has known great times and done great things in our past but I honestly believe this may have been our finest hour. I saw an entire university come together to continue our mission of educating our students, to demonstrate our continued dedication to our students in a whole new way. And we did it with about two weeks notice. Indeed, this may be our finest hour. That phrase I used in that video, our finest hour, I used that three weeks into the pandemic and almost a year and a half ago. I chose that phrase very intentionally. I chose that phrase because of this story I'm about to tell. This story is from a history book that I read about a decade ago by Michael Tagayas, and it was called The Finest Hours. Again, as I always try to say, I didn't write this history. Uh, I'm taking no credit for it. I didn't do the research. I'm just retelling the story. All the credit for this and the facts go to the author, Michael Tagayas. And if there's any inaccuracies in my retelling, well, those, then those are on me. But on the night of February 18, 1952, a tremendous storm hit New England. The storm was so fierce that out in the ocean, within a half hour of one another, two separate oil tankers, each broke in half about 50 miles apart from one another, off the coast of Chatham, Massachusetts. People were trapped in each half so there were four halves floating in different directions, four separate ship halves floating out there, and the Coast Guard had to mount four separate rescue operations. They dispatched ships and planes, and for one of those tanker halves, the stern of the tanker Pendleton seen here, that's the actual stern half of the tanker Pendleton, and if pause for a minute, right above here, you can see the Jacob's Ladder the crew threw over the side. This tanker is 10 stories tall when it sits in the water. And it was riding in the storm. And the Coast Guard sent this small lifeboat to the rescue. This small lifeboat has a crew of four. And it was made to hold 12 people in a rescue. That was its maximum capacity. Four crew members and 12 survivors in a rescue. 
one of the crewmen who was on the boat that day was Irvin Mansky. And he, he reminds me of all of you. When the crew got out in the open ocean that night, the waves were 70 feet high. Think about that. Everyone down here, especially in the front row, look at the ceiling. That ceiling is 35 feet above you, which means the waves in the ocean that night were twice the height of this ceiling, and that crew went out in this little lifeboat. That little lifeboat was tossed around in waves twice the size of this ceiling, and when they got to the stern section of that massive tanker, that tanker was swinging in those 70-foot waves. They had to take the lifeboat, go up to it, grab some survivors, and then get away before it rocked back because it would have crushed the lifeboat in the waves. But they pulled survivors off that Jacob's Ladder, and they started packing those survivors into that lifeboat. And then something else started to happen. That lifeboat started to sink. It started to sink because it was meant to hold 12 survivors, but they were pulling more than that off the ship. They continued to take on the survivors. They squeezed them in next to the engine, into the cargo locker. Anywhere they could, they put them on the boat. They could barely drive the boat because so many people were packed in it, they couldn't move the steering wheel. They got 32 people packed in that lifeboat, built for 12. And they radioed shore and said, we're headed back with 32 survivors back through those waves to try to get to shore. Everyone on shore was stunned. See, this is a coastal village, and at that time, everybody on shore had a maritime radio. They had been listening to the rescue in real time. So the whole town turned out in the storm down to the docks to see what was happening. They brought blankets and coffee for the survivors. There's no way this boat can come back with 32 survivors on it. But it did. And they cheered and they put the survivors in their cars and they drove them for medical care and food. This photo was taken by a newspaper reporter who came down to the docks that day with everyone else. Newspapers across the United States ran this photo and this story over the next couple of days. It is still, to this day, the largest open sea rescue the Coast Guard has ever made by lifeboat. All four of the crew received the Gold Life Saving Award, which is the Coast Guard's highest honor. So I tell you the whole story, but what about Irvin Mansky? I haven't mentioned him yet. Why do I say he's the focus? I mean, he wasn't the commander of the lifeboat. That was somebody else. I say that because Irvin Mansky didn't have to be on that lifeboat that night. The commander of the boat was ordered to go out. The rest of the crew was ordered. Irvin Mansky volunteered. More importantly, Mansky was not even on duty that night. And more than that, he didn't even work at that Coast Guard station. He wasn't a member of the Chatham station. See, Irvin Mansky was 23 years old. He was from a farm outside of Green Bay, Wisconsin. He had just been home on leave and he was heading back to his lighthouse post in a whole nother city on the East Coast. He just happened to be passing through Chatham, Massachusetts that night and looking for a place to sleep. And he stopped at the Chatham station the night the storm hit. As author Michael Tagayas put it, Irvin Mansky had much to lose and not much to gain on this operation with a crew he had never even met before. But he volunteered without a second of uncertainty. Why do I talk about Irvin Mansky? Because Irvin Mansky saw a job that needed done in a crisis, and he did it. It was not his job to do. No one even asked him to do it. And if he had been asked, he could have said no. He didn't even work there. But he didn't say no. He stepped up. Irvin Mansky did the job no one ordered him to do. Irvin Mansky is why this story rings so familiar to me, because I get the distinct pleasure to work with so many people at Idaho State University who are just like that. Over the last year, there were so many things that needed done that we never had to do before, that we had never even planned for before. And you did it. You stepped up. This university has so many people who spent a year and a half seeing things that needed to be done. And without it being their job, they stepped up and did it. What you all did over the last year and a half you, you, 
gave us our finest hours. And I, I get the honor to work with all of you. Thank you. And now we all want next year to be different. (laughs) And like us, our students are looking for next year to be different. They're looking for that transition from what was into what will be. And while we have another wave ahead of us, and we are all now here with masks for now, for now, we must exude hope for our future. We have to. We need to show our students that we are going to get to this. But let me tell you this, this institution has so much grit. Her committee has determined that you have passed. Yes. Congratulations. Uh, thank you guys so much. That's our future. That's where we're going. That is where we are going. But let's take a moment and let me get 100% real with you. We're all sitting here now with masks on our faces. Several people didn't attend today because they would have had to have masks. The only way we are going to be able to deliver on what we just saw and our future and have what students deserve for their future is if every one of us gets a vaccine. (laughs) 
we were all waiting for a year and a half for medical science to find an answer. And with off the charts of efficacy, medical science developed it. They developed the vaccine to move our society forward. For crying out loud, we are a health sciences university. Our own experts on this campus, experts in public health, experts in virology, experts in the, pan, the pharmacology of pandemics, for goodness sakes, have read the science. They know we're dealing with a safe and effective vaccine. It's universally available. It doesn't cost anything. Every member of our Bengal community should get vaccinated, and I will be frank, I expect you to do so. More than that, I would ask every instructor and faculty member, every faculty member at to bring it up in every single class this fall. Encourage your students to get vaccinated. Our students listen to you. You're the experts that they look to for knowledge and guidance in their lives. And I would ask every faculty member to encourage vaccinations in every one of your classes. All I can say is I'm so thankful that 70 years ago, we didn't have the misinformation when Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine. The virus that causes polio is still in our environment. It exists. It's out there. But the reason we don't have a bunch of kids in iron lungs every summer is because we have a vaccine. The reason when you go to the doctor and you cut yourself, the first thing they say is, when was your last tetanus shot? And if you haven't had one or don't remember, they give you one. Medical science has developed the answer. What's going to be the key for us coming back together as a community are vaccines. Everyone needs to be vaccinated because we want to come back together as a community. I know we do, especially I know for our faculty who got into this business because they want to deal with students. All of us do. That's why we work here. We need to come back together as a community. And so I want to talk about something about coming back together as a community. And honestly, uh, I'm a little sheepish about this one. Because uh, I'm going to share a story about me, which I don't usually like to do. Living through the pandemic was difficult. Um, those words don't do justice to how deeply difficult this last year was. I'll be very honest with you, and maybe in the common you know, the vernacular of now, I'll be vulnerable a little bit. Um, my mental health and well-being were not okay much of the time this last year. And I know that many, many people had similar experiences. But even through those dark and isolating times, hope shines through. So I want to share one little piece of my story about hope during the pandemic for me. Now, during the past 15 years or so, I am well aware that I needed to be a little healthier than I was in the past. I tried a lot of things over the last 15 years. Um, they didn't always work, usually didn't. One of the things that I tried over the last 15 years was running. Multiple times, I downloaded the Couch to 5K running app on my phone. Uh, I tried to go out and run. I failed every time. At the time, I would tell myself it was because I, I was never a runner. I'm just not good at it. My body isn't built for running. And so I failed every time. And finally, I just convinced myself, well, I, I can't run. I can't. So I won't. But in the midst of the pandemic, the very first part of the lockdown, when I was dealing with what we were facing, on April 22nd of 2020, I did day one of Couch to 5K. And then I stuck with it. Now, according to the app, if you follow the instructions, you can go from sitting on a couch to running a 5K in eight weeks. Well, I didn't, didn't do it in eight weeks. Um, it took me 12. But on July 22nd at 6.48 a.m., I finished running 3.107 miles without stopping. That's my life. First time ever in my life I ran that far without stopping. 
So even through dark times, when this university was grappling with so much, I did something I never thought I could do. Out of the pandemic, I created hope for myself. And as I reflect on this accomplishment, which honestly I'm kind of proud of, I want to continue this positivity and I want to share that hope, that hope for our future with all of us in our community and share it with our students. So I would like to start a new tradition at Idaho State University, a tradition that is designed to bring us together as a community, something that purposefully brings us together, helps us celebrate one another, turn it into an annual tradition, and in the process, help more students gain access to higher education. This fall, we are going to host an inaugural 5K event. I want us, us, just the faculty and staff, of Idaho State University and our families to come together and do a 5K run slash walk event. I want us to come together, enjoy each, other's, enjoy each other's company, and in the process, raise money for scholarships. So mark your calendar for October 9th. October 9th, we're going to do a walk run. We're going to have at the end, as we start at the Stevens Performing Arts Center and end in the quad, Going through our campus, we're going to have music, we're going to have food, we're going to have a celebration of our community. There's going to be a small $25 entry fee for everybody, but that fee will go into a permanent scholarship endowment. Every single dime, without any deductions, every single dime of your $25 entry fee will help students fund education by going into this permanent endowment. And every single person who registers for this event will also receive a ticket to the football game later that day, no additional cost, comes with your entry fee. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. I'm gonna be personally invested in this, personally invested in this, and here's how. For every faculty and staff member, every one of you faculty and staff who finishes ahead of me in this 5K, <laughs> For every faculty and staff member that beats me in this 5K, I will personally add another $10 into the fund to match your entry fee. And remember, this is a university event. The university is covering the cost of the event, so every dime of your $25 contribution plus my match goes right into that scholarship fund. And I sincerely hope all of you show up that day to celebrate us as a community. And for all of our people in Meridian and Anchorage, I understand it may be a bit of a challenge getting here the morning of the race. If you can make it, please do. We'd love to have you here. But if you cannot, if you're on one of our branch campuses and cannot make it, we still want you to participate. We will have a virtual 5K event that same morning where you can submit your times and still participate in this event. My goal, my goal is creating an annual celebration on this story of hope for our future and how it can meet the hope our students have in seeking an education through the scholarship we will create. Because hope for our future is critical. We have to stay focused on the horizon for ourselves in this university and most of all for our students. So October 9th, let's celebrate. But that horizon we have to stay focused on, that's why this fall we will renew our strategic planning effort. We kicked off this effort in the spring of 2020, but then had to put things on hold in order to deal with the pandemic. Now that we're coming out of the pandemic, it's time to restart this effort. This plan will inform the decisions we make to help our students connect to their future, connect to their community, connect to their future prosperity, and connect them to their world. It will guide our program choices. It's going to guide our budget decisions and the direction we go from here. As we begin these efforts, these four themes will serve as guideposts for this new strategic plan. First, career readiness. Second, relevant research. Third, health and the human experience. And fourth, being student-centered. 
Truly having empathy for the needs of our students requires that we recognize that in addition to gaining new knowledge through education, Students need to graduate ready for a job, a career, and the lifelong professional skills that will allow them to have lasting economic security. And we need research that's relevant to our industries, our employers, our communities, and our whole society. As a university, we have an impact on the health of our communities, our state, and our region. And our statewide leadership in the health sciences already puts us in the position of offering premier academic and research opportunities in the health sciences in pharmaceutical sciences, in biomedical education for our entire region. And the human experience, being human, is impacted by our programs across the university, in the arts, in education, in the trades, in science and engineering, in social science and business, impact people's lives every day. But the only way we're going to have that large of an impact on society is by focusing on how we interact with our students because our students are the catalyst for all that we do. And as we do this effort in strategic planning, I'd like to also take a moment and thank our faculty, our college leadership and academic affairs for their efforts on program health and sustainability. We took an important first step in what will be an ongoing and iterative process to look at our academic program offerings. Our industry is too competitive. Our institution, we all know, is too lean. We owe it to ourselves to continue this journey of looking inward to ensure our programs are aligned to meet the needs of our region and that we are operating efficiently and effectively. We must ensure we have an institution that integrates our strategic plan with program health and sustainability and with our budget model. So this fall, we will continue program health by staying focused on the program action plans and the university-wide alignment of our resources with our academic offerings. We will, in earnest, and with an inclusive, transparent, and trust-based process, develop a new strategic plan, continue program health, and finalize our budget model. This is our future. And as we work on these initiatives that propel us forward over the coming year, we can't forget some of our really important work that's going on right now, and if you sum that word, that work up in a single word, the word is retention. We owe it to our students to help them be successful in their educational endeavors. Given the cost of higher education, we have a moral imperative to ensure that a student does not walk away from this institution lacking the skills or credentials to help them in their life. Now we've Im implemented a lot of retention initiatives. We've implemented the meta majors to ensure students are focused on their course choices. We completely revised our math pathways to get students into the right math class. We're evaluating our first year courses to successfully onboard students for their college experience. We're reviewing Bengal Bridge to see how we can leverage it for the larger student population. And we've completely revamped the academic advising structure to a proactive model for students right from the start. So we've done retention initiatives and we have others, but there's one I want to highlight in particular because I believe it's pivotal to our success. About a year ago, we decided to invest in a student success software tool called ISU Navigate. It's from the Education Advisory Board, and it's an early alert software support tool. Now, I know many of you have heard or read about the successes of Georgia State University. They are widely viewed across the nation as the national leader in innovation to improve student retention. Here's why. Georgia State is a public research university like ISU. 58% of their students are Pell eligible. It had a six-year graduation rate of 32%. In many ways, the demographics of Georgia State University are very similar to the demographics of Idaho State University. In the first four years after they implemented Navigate, they implemented the EAB software Navigate, and in the first four years after they did, their graduation rates went up by 6%. And after they had done it for a decade, after a decade of this initiative, their six-year graduation rate went from 32% to 54%. Their six-year graduation rate in a decade went up by 22%. It's easy to put out those statistics of 22%. But remember, those are made up of students who successfully completed their education. 
They're not just a percentage. Those were students who went out to better their lives by completing their education. So now I'm gonna speak directly to our faculty for a moment. This software implementation relies on you. For this to turn around student retention, faculty have to believe in and use the system. You have to enter the critical data from your courses into ISU Navigate so that the right student support services can respond. The software will alert our academic advisors, our counseling and testing, and our other services, the tutoring services, for example, but only if the faculty use the system. Now, here's what I know for sure. We're gonna stub our toe along the way in this implementation. Software rollouts always have a little trial and error. And we're trying it out first on a limited basis before it goes campus-wide. It will not be perfect on day one, I promise you that. But if we commit to this, if we commit to ISU Navigate, along with all of those other student retention efforts, we can change our retention and graduation rates. It's been done. We can change the trajectory of this entire institution. More importantly, we can change the trajectory of our students' lives. So again, I'm calling on everyone at this university do, to be prepared for and to fully participate in the ISU Navigate rollout. And I need your help on one other issue as well. Now, according to Tim Rennick, Tim Rennick is the Senior VP of Student Success at Georgia State University. He said, what we ended up realizing more than anything else was this. This is his quote. We should never have assumed that students know how to navigate this big bureaucracy that is college. Universities are complex bureaucracies. We have admissions, financial aid, choosing a major, registration, class choice, graduation requirements, and the list goes on. Each of those poses an administrative barrier that students have to overcome. And as faculty and staff, I know we do our best to support students through this. I know we do. But so often, maybe having an extra guide, an extra connection can make all the difference. So I'm very excited to announce this initiative. This was dreamed up and envisioned by our own student affairs staff. They came up with the idea to provide that guide, that connection. It's called Bengal Connect. And this is how it's going to work. Student affairs is going to identify based on demographics of our incoming class, about 500 of our new and incoming students that are most likely to not continue their education after the first year. And we're gonna ask faculty and staff members to sign up as mentors for those students. Those that sign up will be assigned just three or four students that they can reach out to at least once a month. Maybe meet them in the union for lunch or just be available if they have a question. Essentially be that personal connection, that resource for those new students. You could be that someone who makes a difference in helping a student navigate the complexities of the university. But also you could be that connection for one of those students. So this is what we need. We need faculty and staff willing and available to help out students in this way. So I'm asking you, if you're willing to help our students like that, please go to isu.edu slash bengalconnect and sign up. And thank you, thank you to our student affairs staff for coming up with this concept to help our students because of how much you care. Thank you. Now, as long as we're talking about retention, we also know that one of the top reasons students give when they stop out in their first year is financial barriers. So it's time we fix that. So today, I am announcing the kickoff of a fundraising campaign to raise money for student scholarships. We are going to run a scholarship campaign. It's going to be targeted, targeted in time two years two years from today. And in two years from today, we are going to raise $20 million for student scholarships. More than 83% of the students at Idaho State University qualify for financial aid. More than 40% of our students identify as first generation college students. Finances can no longer be the top reason for stopping out. Because of that, we don't have time to wait. 
We're going to raise that money for students right now. That's why it's a two-year campaign. We're going to raise that money, and we're going to raise $20 million to go direct to student scholarships, put that money in our students' pockets so they can get an education. We're going to do that in two years. We're going to be successful. And then as soon as that campaign is done two years from now, we are going to begin our next major comprehensive funding campaign for all aspects of the university. That's our future. That's where we're headed. It's going to happen. And speaking of the commitment for future and fundraising to do it, that's something else I am super excited to announce today. Last fall. Last fall, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Holt Arena, celebrating all the fantastic moments at this university and this community and everything we have known and experienced in the Holt Arena. But now, it's time for an upgrade. And once again, with the help of our fantastic partner at Idaho Central Credit Union, we're going to do just that. At next week's State Board of Education meeting, we will be requesting approval to move forward with a major renovation of Holt Arena. You see, ICCU is a partner with us in the true sense of the word. They're a partner for this entire community and this entire state. They are a partner. They're a partner to the entire educational system all the way through K-12 and higher ed. So not only did they help with the final gift that put our alumni center over the top for the groundbreaking we did this summer, but they have agreed to invest in a major renovation to Holt Arena. This renovation is gonna replace every single seat in Holt Arena. It's gonna improve the entryways. It's gonna add donor hospitality areas. It's gonna provide an upgraded fan experience for every single person in Holt Arena. And once more, speaking about our partnership with Idaho Central Credit Union, they are going to fund 100% of this renovation. I cannot say enough about Idaho Central Credit Union. So I'll say this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you for your generous support of this university. You are forever a part of the Bengal legacy. As many of you know, Kent Oram is an alumnus of Idaho State University and he's the CEO of ICCU. And Kent is here today along with his team. Kent, you and your team, you are an amazing steward of Idaho State University and your investment is so appreciated. Everyone, please, thanks. <laughs> we are moving forward like ICCU and our other philanthropic partners that help us out, our own faculty are making huge strides in bringing investment and funding to this institution in support of our mission. Despite the year of COVID, research at Idaho State University grew both in the number of grants awarded and in the amount of grants awarded this past year. Last year, we had a 10% year-over-year increase in external agency grant funded numbers. And again, not counting federal stimulus money, not counting CARES Act funding. This is research grants to our students went up by $2.8 million last year. We were up in COSI by 500,000. We were up in Cal by 300,000. And in the combined KDH, KDHS colleges, we were up by over 2 million in external support. This is our research history awards. We are turning the corner. Great job faculty, it's fantastic. because we should never forget our role as a research university. Our role is expanding the horizons of human knowledge and taking that knowledge into the classroom for our students, taking that knowledge to lift our community and our world up. That is the value of higher education. And while I believe in this value, and I know all of you here believe in this value as well, there are others who do not. 
Three years ago this week, I stood on this stage for the very first time. I talked to all of you in a fall address for the very first time. And I told a story, the story of when the framers of our Constitution walked out of Independence Hall and Benjamin Franklin reportedly stood, told the crowd, and he said, he stood in front of that historic building and he said to the crowd, we have brought you a republic if you can keep it. Meaning that this country was built and founded upon the principle that the stability of the republic depends mainly upon the education of the people. We, the people in this room and listening today, have a noble charge. A noble charge to spread and share knowledge to the citizenry of this country and this entire world. Let me say again, this is our charge. And never in my life would I have thought the education, the education would be so contested and scorned. Our educators across the state at every level, our educators across this state deserve better. But what we must do during these most troubling of times is not yield or break under the pressure, but instead redouble our commitment to our cause, to educate students, not to teach them what to think, but we teach them how to think. We are educating the future leaders of Idaho, and these leaders need to understand there are differing viewpoints that exist in the world and that those viewpoints are valued. Through the exchange of viewpoints, students learn to critically evaluate different stances and different opinions and learn to have difficult conversations to try to reach productive results. Our role is to participate and encourage learning through civil public discourse on the issues that face our society. To provide a place where people can, in a civil and respectful manner, express their own viewpoints. We can we should, and we will be the place where the true spirit of the First Amendment is always protected. And the true spirit of the First Amendment, I mean that every topic may be discussed, debated, researched, and talked about without censorship. In other words, the role of higher education is to be the model of civility in public discourse. And so, as I usually do, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> On March 30th of 1981, I just happened to be homesick from school that day. So I, March, March 30, 1981, I was homesick laying on the couch watching TV. And as I'm watching TV, breaking news comes on the TV. And the news story says that the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, has just been shot. And I watched it play out on TV for the next several hours from the couch. Watched it all play out. And I remember that after he was shot, President Reagan was taken to George Washington University Hospital. It was the nearest one to where it happened. Now they, they thought he had broken his ribs. He was having some pain in his ribs, and they thought they, they broke his ribs when they shoved him in the limousine when the shooting started. But when they got to the hospital, he started coughing up blood, and the hospital team found uh, the bullet entry wound that went into his lung. So the hospital trauma team immediately takes him to the OR for operations. The surgery took more than an hour and a half, and they said he was probably within a half hour of dying had they not operated. But as they were uh, wheeling uh, President uh, Reagan into the operating room on the gurney, he, he grabbed his oxygen mask and he pulled it aside and he said to the trauma team, he said, I hope you're all Republicans. <laughs> Now, the head of surgery for George Washington University Hospital and the head of the trauma surgery unit was a doctor named Joseph Giordano. Dr. Giordano was an avowed Democrat. He was a very loyal and lifelong avowed Democrat. When President Reagan looked at them and said, I hope you're all Republicans, Dr. Giordano looked down at the president and he said, today, Mr. President, we are all Republicans. Being able to say someone during a crisis that on that day, 
we are all on the same team. Well, there's no reason in the world why that cannot be how all of us respond to and have civil discourse with those with whom we might politically disagree. This republic and this nation is worth that. And like I said earlier, I believe all of us in this room over the last year may have been our finest hour. When other universities across the nation did not stay open, we carried out our mission. We increased new knowledge in society. We delivered for our students and their education. And for that, nothing short of Herculean effort, we were rewarded by unfounded, spurious, and inaccurate accusations. But for higher education, it's not how they push us down. And it's not about how hard we punch back. It's about the fact that we get back up and we continue our mission to educate our citizens and continue to form a more perfect union. That more perfect union that at Idaho State University we have been working on since our founding 120 years ago. And that we will continue to work on for the next 120 years. Because our 120 year legacy is so important to protect and honor. And one of the milestones we're going to celebrate this fall. This fall when our College of Pharmacy celebrates its 100th anniversary. Now, In reality, it's its 101st anniversary, but last year we couldn't come together and celebrate. This fall we will. The College of Pharmacy is the bedrock foundation upon which all of our health science mission was later built. A century of educating, research, and improving the professional practice of pharmacy, we actually see the college's impact. So many student lives forever changed So many people whose lives were made better through the medicinal services our graduates provide. A hundred-year legacy of our College of Pharmacy. This celebration will be a real tribute to why we are here, what we do for society, how we change lives, how we improve health and the human condition, on why it's important to help our students find their way here And once here, do everything we can to retain them and have them stay and reach their educational goals. The celebration will be a symbol of our legacy. And finally, I am not, and if anybody thinks I am, I am not leaving this stage until I have said how proud I am of the women's basketball team who posted... who posted a team GPA of 3.6 while defeating the University of Idaho by 35 points in the conference championship game. (laughs) And who all but one of them are returning. And the only reason one isn't returning is because she graduated and is now a graduate student in one of our most high Uh, uh, high demand and difficult to get in graduate programs. This team's coming back. Watch out the rest of the big sky. They're still here. So this year, this year we are going to, in earnest, address our retention issues. We're going to implement a mentor program an ISU Navigate program. We're going to start raising $20 million for student scholarships for our students. We're going to start a remodel of Holt Arena. We're going to develop a new strategic plan and become the best version of ourselves. We're going to increase our research production. We're going to be a place for the civil exchange of ideas, all ideas. We're going to honor our role in creating and protecting knowledge while continuing to build a campus culture based on those foundational principles of trust, compassion, stability, and hope, because we are going to have that hopeful future. So all that and much more for us to look forward to this coming year as we welcome back our new and returning students and we come roaring back from the pandemic and once again 
We go statewide to show this state our roar, roar, Bengals, roar.